Good evening. I am your chair, Steve Conklin, and it's a different viewpoint from here. So uh, thank you for being here tonight. This is the Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting for Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Uh, calling the meeting to order. If you would rise for the pledge of Thank you very much. Uh, just a few announcements before we do roll call. We do have a, a new member tonight, Dietrich Hoffner from the city of Louisville. Fantastic. Thank you so much and welcome. Uh, new alternate, Sandy Hammerley from the town of Superior. Is Sandy here? So let's give her a round of applause. A couple of additional announcements uh, for our new members or just everybody's reminder. If your representative is present and you are the alternate, we can only have one representative from each jurisdiction that can participate. So at the main table is the one representative and any alternates uh, would be in the audience. So thank you for hearing that. Uh, instructions for the table mics, which I think to this day are still elusive for many of us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are instructions in front of the microphone how to operate it. When the microphone is live, it's picking up your audio. The head of the microphone will light up red. Red, okay? <laughs> A couple of other brief announcements. At your table, at your seat, you have uh, two uh, Dr. Cog pins. One is a magnet, the other one is a more traditional pin pin. Those, thank you to Dr. Cog for those. Those are awesome. So uh, take those uh, with you. Uh, for those of you that have not been here before or have been and, and don't know, there is parking in the building, and Melinda has the parking voucher. Be sure to get that before you leave uh, so that your parking is paid for tonight. That uh, Out in the little hallway there, there's coffee, there's cookies, and also the bathrooms at the end of the hall. There are those things so people were aware of those items. And with that, Melinda Stevens will do our roll call. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, here we go. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Ashley Stolzman, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, Sitting County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. Here. Nicholas Williams, City and, Co City and County of Denver. Here. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Here. Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Here. Tracy Crafts Arp, Jefferson County. Leslie Dahl Kemper, Jefferson County. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Here. Dustin Zvonek of Aurora. Juan Marcano of Aurora. Present. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Royce Pindell, Bennett. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Margo Ramsden, Bomar. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Kim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Here. <clears throat> Todd Williams, uh, Central City. Here. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Craig Hurst, Commerce City. Here. Catherine Whitman, Nakono. Nathaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Ryan Duchere, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Hello. Jeslyn Sherezai, Lakewood. Here. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Winshaw, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Present. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Netherland. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Tim Long, North Glen. John Dyack, Parker. Jeff DeBorg, Parker. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. 
Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Here. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move ahead to approve the agenda. One quick note, item number 14, Eyes version was sent out via email. Uh, it's also posted on the website. If you don't have that, you can certainly talk to Melinda Stevens for you. I wanted to make, uh, make aware that there was a, a change in that item. Do we have a motion on approval of the, the agenda? Hello, moves, a second. Oh, Director Wheel, thank you very much. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Attention. Thank you very much. We have an agenda. And with that, we have a briefing on Proposition 123. And I will ask Sheila Lynch to uh, uh, make that introduction. She's Director of Regional Planning and Development. Wonderful. Thank you, Chair Conklin. And good evening, um, Board Directors. So we're fortunate to be joined by um, our colleagues at uh, DOLA this evening to share about Proposition 123 that was adopted by Colorado voters in 2022. Several hundred million dollars of affordable housing will become available in the second half of 2023 due to Proposition 123. This funding will be overseen by the Department of Local Affairs and the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. Eligibility of funding will be linked to a commitment from cities and counties to increase their affordable housing stock above a baseline amount and DOLA is hosting many opportunities for local governments to learn about the implementation of Proposition 123, and we thought it would be great to have them here tonight to share with all of you. Mo Miskell, who serves as the project manager for DOLA, will be sharing about the process for cities and counties to establish their commitment. So thank you for being here, Mo, and I'll pass it on to you. Great, thank you, Sheila. You guys hear me okay? Good evening. Um, as mentioned, I'm Mo Miskell. I'm the Deputy Division Director for Division of Housing, and I am the one that's fortunate enough to be working on Proposition 123 and all of you, and of course our implementation partners in getting this effectively implemented. Uh, Gary uh, Ventures uh, did a great job of, and of course, as you guys know, Mike Johnson did a fantastic job of uh, running Proposition 123. Of course, the voters voted it in. Now the really messy part starts, right? We've got to make sense of it uh, and apply it in such a way that makes sense to everybody else. And so a big part of that is working with local jurisdictions and helping them understand what is actually being asked of them, how we can help. We're not here to direct. We're here to help, ultimately, and working together to make something that works for Colorado, right? Sorry, I am used to making this presentation from home. The last three years have been interesting, so I don't have all my bells and whistles in front of me, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, Sheila, great job of uh, uh, the introduction on Prop 123. As you can see, this slide just talks about the DOH, Division of Housing. So DOLA, Division of Housing, is the higher represent. And I'm only here to talk about our part of it. But of course, there's another big piece of this, as mentioned by Sheila. You have the Office of Economic Development and International Trade, also known as OEDIT, and they're partnering with CHAFA to administer their part of it. And so they're getting 60% of the funds. We're getting 40% of the funds. And as you can see here, we're talking about two fiscal years. Half a fiscal year, so funds from January 1st of this year to June 30th of this year is the first tranche. So that's fiscal year number one. And that's what UC estimated is just for us, our 40%, not the uh, 60% for OEDIT. And then you see the 116 on a full year. These are estimates. This is what we're anticipating. We'll know more as the uh, numbers get crunched uh, this year, and we'll hopefully have a, a number arriving on and after July 1st that represents this, or if not better, which would be fantastic, right? And uh, as you can see at the bottom of this slide, uh, we have three programs that we're operating uh, uh, primarily. Uh, one is home ownership. So we have uh, uh, three offices, the Office of Housing, Finance, and Sustainability. Uh, Andrew Perez, some of you may have worked on him on development issues. He'll be leading that effort on ownership, home ownership, excuse me. And then uh, Kristen Toombs, our Office of Housing, uh, Homeless Initiative, excuse me, uh, the program director, the director for that office will be handling homelessness, but we'll also have an opportunity to potentially partner with our Office of Housing Recovery, which has the uh, 
Emergency Rental Assistance Program, which some of you probably know has been winding down. The federal funds for that program have been spent or near spent. I think they're going to be fully spent at the end of next month or sometime around next month. And we have a bridge gap financing going on of about $8 million coming through this legislative session to continue it on. But there's an opportunity here to potentially use some of these funds. So more on the program stuff at another time. I'm going to be giving you guys a high-level overview. And what I'm focusing on primarily is the last piece. But before I get to that, there's a local planning capacity to division of um, local government, who you guys are probably intimately familiar with, working with the fine folks at DLG. So we are charged with that piece of it. But the division of local government, since they work so closely with local governments, are going to be helping us with that. So the first one, home ownership, we're looking at our 40%, we can utilize up to 50% of that for that particular program. For the homelessness, out of our 40%, we could use about 45% of that. And the last program, last but not least, an important one, the local planning capacity development program through uh, DLG is the remaining 5% of our 40%. But all of that is built on the last piece you see here, which is local government affordable housing three-year commitment. And that's what I'm here to primarily talk about. We had a big meeting about that today from noon to 2. Hopefully some of you were able to join. We spent two hours talking about this very piece, uh, the, establishing the baseline, and, of course, ultimately the commitment. So that's what we're going to delve into this evening. If you want to talk about the program funding, there will be more opportunities to do that. I'll get into that towards the end of the presentation. So commitments. Have you guys all read Proposition 123? All right, all 21 pages of it. Well, one-third of it was devoted to this piece, right? That's how important this is. Everything is built on this commitment piece. So it's the one you want to pay real close attention to and why we're here is to help local governments understand it and help them, of course, ultimately implement it. Um, as you can see from the top, November 1st is our first deadline, which is not that far along when you think about it, uh, especially since we're building and flying the plane, as someone so astutely uh, observed earlier. Um, and, of course, we're also going through a legislative session right now. So this potentially could change, right? Uh, my understanding is the legislative body will want to respect the voters as much as possible. So if any modifications are made, there will be minor important adjustments based on feedback uh, the proponents of uh, Prop Proposition 123 have been getting back. But we can't wait around to see how all that shakes out because we have this November 1st deadline, which is an important deadline for our local governments, right? So we've already started the process of building the plane, right? Um, and just so you know, this is all built on three-year commitments, right? So if we're talking about the first phase, the first cycle, I should say. That's the first November 1st for this year. Um, after that, it's going to be every three years, November 1st uh, of that third year. And um, for this one, and this is where I'm naked here because I don't have all my tools in front of me, we have some pretty neat neat, slick stuff that we're putting on our website. Uh, so if you have a chance, I can send you guys a link. Normally I'm talking and sending it in the chat feature so you guys can all see it. I don't have it loaded here. I'd be more than happy to do it. But if you just go to our website, um, the Dola website, you'll see on the top banner, right is a, a Proposition 123 banner. If you click on that, it will take you to the website for this. Okay, On that website, you're going to see a couple of things. Uh, one of them is uh, just a whole slew of information. Some of it I'll cover here, but go into greater detail. But an important one is a tabulation of the baseline numbers, which I'm going to get to here in a second. So if anyone's on there right now, just play around with it. You'll see some cool stuff. It's actually going to get more interesting because we're also developing, we have been developing an, uh, an interactive website that goes into more uh, detail and allows more uh, back and forth between us and interested local governments. Okay? Uh, that, also went live today, actually. I just don't have the link for it. But I can send it to you guys after this presentation. Um, so before we get to the commitment, though, that's the big piece we're all shooting for, right? We got to get the baseline numbers established. So Proposition 123 laid out basically three options. Two, ready to go. One, we can work with you on it, right? And the two that are ready to go, dated information, as you can imagine. And we're working through it the best we can. Uh, but we've actually gone ahead and tabulated those numbers for you, all the jurisdictions in Colorado, right? If you already take care of your own numbers, fantastic. Please compare. 
If you like your numbers better, awesome. That's where the third option comes into play, right? Um, as long as you can justify it and show why it makes sense for your needs, we're good to go with it, right? If you don't have it, right, then you've got these two other options presented um, uh, through Proposition 123 to utilize, and we've already done those numbers for you, okay? And that is that um, baseline number uh, page I was talking about on our website if you want to look at it. And then, even with that, please ignore the first bullet. There's actually an error I didn't catch soon enough. Uh, ignore that, and it was never there. So the petition process is actually these other two. The first bullet was trying to address what I just mentioned earlier, right? If you have numbers that make more sense for you, right, that are in compliance with Proposition 123, you can use that, right? Um, it's not really a petition process, and it's not, most certainly not a different uh, AMI, okay? It was just poorly written there and in the wrong place. But for the petition process, out of the other options that are provided, you can choose some other routes that may suit your needs better, right? If you don't like your numbers, for whatever reason, you don't think it's an accurate reflection of actually what's going on in your jurisdiction today because we're dealing with some pretty dated numbers, um, and some of your neighbor's numbers, for instance, work better, the adjacent jurisdiction, you can use that. Proposition 123 actually allows for that, right? Um, if you're on a bordering jurisdiction, right, you can utilize another state's uh, um, county if that's who you're touching. Um, and, of course, you can use uh, the state median income as well. Uh, I shouldn't say AMI. That's another error. Apologies. Just say state median income. So these are outlined in Proposition 123. And uh, a good example is if you're on, if you guys have computers in front of you, some of you do, and you're on that um, baseline tabulation uh, page that I mentioned, if you check out Littleton, for example, who's here? Who here is from Littleton? Awesome. Right next to me. Sweet. You, sir, have an amazing amount of options, right? Uh, and I didn't know this until you can tell I'm not a native. Uh, I didn't know Littleton was in three counties. Uh, it's pretty cool. I can imagine. <laughs> Um, so you've got Arapaho, Douglas, and Jefferson, right? So if you go to Littleton, it's amazing the sheer number of options available to Littleton as a result. Um, some people may not be a big fan of that. I would think if I'm the local government, I'm a huge fan of that. Options are good, right? Uh, so take a look at that. For Littleton, you'll see every county, even though Littleton itself is not touching all these other counties you can draw from, right? The fact that it's in three counties and those counties are touching all those counties, provides it with a slew of options, okay? Um, keep in mind, if you're in a municipality, you're applying your AMI, unless you can do something better, right? Um, and of course, if you're a county, you're applying for the unincorporated part of the county, right? But once again, if you are a little to the municipality and your number doesn't make sense for you, then you're utilizing the county status, three of them, to touch other counties. Does that make sense to everybody? So pretty cool that the proponents of 123 allowed for that flexibility. Uh, and of course, if Littleton doesn't like any of that, it can still use the state medium income. Yes? I'm in Thornton and we have, we need to use the microphone. I'm over in Thornton and we have multiple well, neighboring Anyways, I guess, what is the first number at full units in three years, you're saying? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not that. on the uh, page here. Go to Littleton, since you seem familiar. Oh, no. I can go to anywhere you want. I just got to get the page up. And let's look at Thornton, because that's where I'm from. <laughs> Can I use this and actually just drive this and pull it up? Oh, okay. I'll just do it on my phone then. All right. Bear with me. I should have anticipated this. Yeah, there's a Nebraska city on here. That All right, loading. 
Oh, I got it. Thanks. Oh, you're amazing. <coughs> you're incredible. Okay. So what's your question? Sorry. What is your question again? Well, I'm looking at Thornton, and I don't agree with some of these or don't understand. Like, we're not, not neighboring to Alaska. I don't understand what that means or why those numbers are in there. But what is the first column? Let's just go with the first one that has Adams County, Arapahoe, Broomfield, Denver, Jefferson, 9,535. Is that units? Is that, what am I looking at? Correct. That's your affordable housing stock. Okay. Yeah. And so, that would be in a three-year period? No, that's your baseline. Baseline. So, yeah. So, sorry. We're talking about two different things. It's important to get that. Baseline is your starting point, right? And that's what your three-year commitment is going to do is build from that. And sorry, we're going to get into more detail of that at the end here. So the baseline is what we're trying to establish where you're starting, right? So we have tabulated that baseline based on the options presented to Proposition 123. You may not like those numbers. I'm sorry I can't show it to you here for everybody. Some of you don't have a laptop, but that is your starting point. That is what we have determined based on our number crunching that you are starting at 9,000 535, right? So in if that you don't category, like that, if it doesn't suit your needs for whatever reason, right, you can utilize these other options provided. So that first section, that first line where it has all of the counties versus go down to just the one Thornton City that has just Adams, and I go to state median income, and there's a lot of things in this column Correct. that are not the so, same. Yeah, so if you so yours the one you're looking for first as a starting point is own AMI, right? And according to this, I'm not from Thornton, but according to what we've calculated, Thornton actually lies in two counties, Adams and Wells. Okay? Because of that, those counties touch other counties, right? So those other counties include Morgan County, Washington County, who have their own number, right? They also touch upon Logan County and um, Morgan County, sorry, so Morgan County, Washington County, Logan County, Morgan County, Larimer County, Larimer County, Wyoming, Kimball County, Nebraska, Boulder County. So you, like Littleton, have a lot of options, basically because Thornton apparently is in two. So I would like the lowest option, right? I mean, if that's the baseline. For us, we don't have any water, so it could be zero, and we can't add any more until we get water. But... I mean, Morgan County, Washington is 6,000 less than. That is for you to determine, not for us. I would think that would be the number we would want to start at. I mean, I could be wrong. <laughs> I guess that it clears it up like mud, but sure. <laughs> Can I can I ask a question too? Um, the if if we establish a baseline using a specific county or basis um, for one app for for a three year timeline, um, can that change? Can that methodology? Are you basically sticking with that methodology over time? For just the three years, but when you go to reapply theoretically for the next three year, you could change your methodology potentially. And that, and and you would have to calculate a new baseline because we would we should assume we're going to lose some naturally occurring potentially or some deed restrictions might sunlight sun, sunset. So, is it assumed that we would our baseline might readjust every three years? Can you guys hear me? Apologies. Was I loud enough in the back? Can you hear me before? Do I have to repeat everything? <laughs> um, yeah, once you select a baseline, you're locked in for that three-year commitment because obviously you're building off of that baseline. 
But to us, it makes sense that if you need to reset for the next three-year cycle, right, that you do so. And one last question about the, the AMI calculation that we would use for this. Is it at all related to the AMI that we would use for the town or for, um, for um, a city or a town for, like, um, CHAFA or other financing, like LIHTC, or is that just just the county in which, because Westminster has two counties. Right. It's going to be specific to your locality. And there's an affordable housing definition in Prop 123. It's referring to 60% for rental, 100% for uh, home ownership, and then uh, 30 you can't, uh, the home can't spend more, expend more than 30% of its uh, income on that. Right. Sorry. So what I was actually asking was the AMI um, for those financing tools or grants or anything like that, we would just use our use the county that it's in. We wouldn't establish or have any relationship to the AMI that we would choose for yeah. this baseline. You're going to be using your AMI and stick to the definition to calculate the baseline. The financing is going to be separate. Two different things. Actually, yeah. third thing, right? So baseline, commitment, then program funding, right? So three different things. So what I'm talking about is establishing a baseline, and you're going to use that to build your commitment, and you're going to get that commitment to unlock the money, right? And those programs will be having conversations with you about what that looks like, right? Um, and there's specifics in Prop 123 about what they have to do. And the good news is they don't have to hit like 60%, you know, for rental, for example, right? Um, they can do um, averaging, right? So they can do slew of uh, uh, AMIs to hit the 60%, to average it out, if that makes sense. Yeah, so more to follow. So the good news is the program part of it is a lot more to follow. So I want you to write two different important dates on your, uh, on your computer or on your uh, piece of paper with your pen. So March 24th, next Friday, Division of Housing will be hosting its program-specific outreach event. Um, and that way you can learn more about with the question you were asking about, from a program financing perspective, what do, the, what do the AMIs mean, right? Today I'm here to talk about simply establishing your baseline and the commitments. I hope that makes sense. Um, so hopefully I didn't butcher your question too badly, or at least answering it. Yes? If you're part of a consortium, a housing partnership that involves multiple jurisdictions, can I still pick my own? Sorry, can you repeat that? If I'm, I'm part of a housing partnership, so when we do affordable housing, we pool oh. our resources among several jurisdictions. Does that mean we can pick one of all of those? No. Uh, establishing the baseline is specific to a jurisdiction, not a consortium of jurisdictions. You may get together and talk about how a commitment, you know, all you're doing a commitment, you can work together to achieve all your commitments. But the baseline itself is specific to you and you only. And then that commitment is specific to you, you only. Um, but you can get together and form a partnership to do the development. Uh, but the baseline is can't be shared. Great question, though. It actually came up this afternoon, too. Yeah, yes, sir. A 3% increase, I'm reading. Yeah. Is that dependent upon a county and its municipalities? Whatever we set it up as, that's the increase in the affordable housing. The 3% is based upon what we use to set up our baseline, correct? correct. So if we include the municipalities, then we would have to increase all of them by 3%. If we only talk about the unincorporated portion of the county, and that is the three percent. Yeah, you're only, if you're a county, you're only talking about the unincorporated part of the county. The municipalities will be addressing their own. But again, if okay, so you can have partnerships though, but they would have a separate three percent based on what their exactly. increase is. They would, okay. have, they would have their own baseline, their own three percent. You guys could work together to figure it out for everybody but they'd be responsible for growing their 3% to their baseline, ultimately. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yes, sir. 
and the and the credit for the three percent or the credit for the units that are built are only they're geographically specific. That jurisdiction, correct. You got it. You got it exactly. That's where it could get potentially muddy in, in, a, in a partnership. A lot of opportunity, right? Um, but you also got to figure out to make sure it's clear who's getting what, right, and when. Um, and the good news is Proposition 123 is very specific, and it says that 3% is for each year for that three-year cycle. Uh, we've interpreted that to mean ultimately what it's trying to achieve is 9% for the three years, right? So if for any reason you're unable to get 3% that first year, that's not an issue. You just got to ultimately get 9% at the end of it. Uh, so we did get that clarification from Gary uh, that they were in agreement that that was an appropriate, appropriate interpretation of the law. So that's the good news. The bad news is we got to figure out how to get you guys there. Not bad news, but a lot of work to be done. Yes, sir. What happens if that 9% isn't reached? So say you have housing projects that are initiated in year and three to get to 9%, but you don't achieve 9% of like move-in ready housing by that date. What, what's the actual consequence of the municipality? Great question. You must have read Proposition 123. <laughs> You're teeing it up perfectly. Uh, so there's actually, before I get to that though, I want to get to the commitment piece and what happens if you don't make the commitment, right? So the good news about Proposition 123 is, well, the bad news is there is a penalty. There is, you know, there is a consequence for not doing it. The good news is it's not much of a consequence, right? Uh, there are actually ways to get back into play. Um, I, I don't say, I shouldn't say it lightly. Uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a consequence, but it's not detrimental, right? Um, so for the commitment piece, if you don't make the first cycle, November 1st of this year, then you're sitting, you, 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 the consequence is there's going to be no funding available for your jurisdiction, which is big, right? But it's for one year, right? So it's not going to crush anybody, I would think not. And you could really, if you weren't ready for this November 1st, you can use that time to then figure out your baseline, work with us, figure out your commitment, work with us, right? And get it established for the next year. So instead of a three-year commitment, you could potentially be working towards a two-year commitment. And instead of 9% overall, you're looking at 6% commitment, right? And you can do a one-year commitment if that suits you best for now, right? Um, so instead of looking at 9, 6, you're looking at 3% for that one year. So that's, that, that is a great thing that they put in Proposition 123. Now, to answer your question, if you, for example, committed this cycle and you don't get that accomplished, right, at the end of the three years, Proposition 123 once again says, and this is not just a local jurisdiction, right, anybody that's doing any development work in your jurisdiction cannot access these funds. Once again, for a year. Right, so if you were um, uh, out for that year, if you, if you didn't comply by December 31st of 2026, right, that's your three years, right? If it's determined at that point you just did not achieve the 9%, then you're sitting out the 2027 calendar year, okay? But then the good news is you can apply by November 1st of 2027, right, for the next cycle. Oh, excuse me. Or sorry, November 1st. Yeah, for the next cycle. And in that case, you'd be talking about a two-year cycle, right? Because you, you just sat out a year. Does that make sense? So you can get back into the game for a two-year cycle if you don't meet the commitment the requirements by December 31st of 2026. Yes. Thor. Uh, yes, thank you. I was just going to ask in cl for clarity. So it's a three-year cycle. You can only apply. So if we couldn't do it this year, we would have to. No. Every it's, year. It, it's a full three-year cycle, but you can plug in a two and one year. So it's a yearly opportunity, but it would be shortened in the number. Exactly, exactly. So it's string from three to two to one, but we're always playing with the three-year cycle at the max. You got it. Great questions. Anyone else? Uh, you first. I think you're having one first. She just be you, barely. All right. Thank you. Uh, Juan Marcano with the City of Aurora. So um, I think we were probably the first jurisdiction to actually opt into this already. Um, but I have questions for smaller jurisdictions who might not have the staff capacity that we do. Um, how can they get on track to comply and be able to opt in? Is there going to be technical assistance offered to some of our smaller towns? Well, I'm excited to hear you've opted in, but we haven't had anybody opted yet because we haven't rolled it out quite yet. Oh, we, we, we resolved to do it already, so we're there. Fantastic. <laughs> See, we need more of you. Uh, Sheridan also said they're very much interested. So 
So that's, that's two down, many more, 330. How many of you guys are there? Uh, many more to go, but that's fantastic news. Great to hear about Aurora. Uh, we are actually rolling out uh, here probably by early next week at the latest, uh, maybe middle of the week, um, a form to do just what you just talked about. And so what that form will do, so first of all, what I would like you guys to do between now and then is to figure out who's going to speak on your behalf. Maybe it's you, maybe it's somebody else for Aurora, right? Uh, we want to make sure there's only one chef in that kitchen, right? We don't want to create confusion, especially the disagreement. So make sure you guys appoint one person to speak on behalf of your local jurisdiction, whether it be a municipality or a county for the unincorporated part, okay? And then we're going to be sending out a form, and you guys will, that person will identify themselves as speaking on behalf of that jurisdiction, and then we'll provide some information about the baseline. Right, and if they go ahead and accept their own baseline, whether it be two, two you know, two versions of it, or, or they're not sure, sorry, their own baseline, right? If they accept it, then they're done. They're moving on to the next piece, which is the commitment piece, right? If they choose a neighboring baseline, now it's kick, triggering the petition process, right? Or the state median income, right? Triggering the, the um, petition process, then there's going to be a little bit more information we ask for. Just just explain to us why, right, and how you, and, and why it makes sense for you. Now, if they decide to none of that works for them, right, they prefer to use their own number, right, then they just got to add a little bit more detail about that as well. But once you get past the baseline is established, we're then going to publish that so you, everybody knows, right, this is what Aurora is doing, okay? Um, and then you will continue on to the commitment piece. And then uh, right now we're beta testing. Actually, it's not going to be next week because we're going to be beta testing it. We had a whole slew of you guys, and I think Aurora was one of them, on the call today that volunteered to do that. So we're going to have several people check it out. Um, um, actually, no, that's not true. That's the interactive uh, piece of the, the data I just talked about. Paul, you take it back. We're going to be rolling this out next week. Fill it out. If you have any questions about it, let us know. But that's going to be your formal commitment. Um, and, um, and once that happens, like I said, we will publish on our website what your baseline is, and then what your commitment looks like. And actually, no, I'm all messed up. May 1st is what we're shooting for. May 1st is the form being rolled out that I mentioned um, and your, uh, your, your ability to commit, okay? Yeah, I got the dates mixed up in my head. Coming soon, though, some of your beta testing is that uh, the tabulation that you saw on your uh, computers is – as pointed out by Thorne, it's helpful, but not that helpful to an extent. We're creating an interactive version of that to give you a lot more options and um, ability to manipulate the information so it suits your needs. So that one is being beta tested by several jurisdictions uh, in the next few weeks, and you should see a different iteration of what you currently see. Yeah. Thank you for that. This is the last slide. Any other questions? And I can jump to this. To finish the slide, and I'll have the question after that. Okay. You want to wait until after another slide, or you want to go now? Okay. Thank you. Um, so the first communication we had about the, everything I'm just talking about today went out on, on February 21st. That was an email that you should have all received. Um, we've been building our, um, our, our list serve over time, as you can imagine. Bounce back emails, people telling us that they have been getting it, so just if you haven't been getting it directly, just let us know. We'd be more than happy to add you to the listserv. March, of course, has come upon us. We had a big meeting today that I mentioned uh, from noon to 2. If you couldn't make that meeting, it was recorded. It's going to be on our website. A lot of good content that we covered for two hours. Uh, the other meeting that I mentioned earlier that you all wrote down, I forgot to mention the second one, is, uh, of course, the March 24th date. So if you want to talk about the programs and the, and the funding that comes with Proposition 123, Please, please, please make that meeting, especially if you're interested in division housing programs. Remember, home ownership, homelessness, and of course, uh, the local uh, capacity, right? Local planning capacity. Now, the other one that I did fail to mention earlier is, of course, the OEDA Chaffa one on its programs, okay? That one is going to be on April 4th, all right? Uh, so, those are two dates you definitely want to make if you want to hear more about the programs and the funding. And you've got some excellent questions about what they should be thinking about that they may not already be thinking about with regard to that, 
Okay, so keep those dates in mind. And then this is the one I jumbled earlier, uh, Aurora, sorry. May 1st, that's when the commitment window is actually starting. So if you're already ready to go, fantastic. Let's have some conversations. Maybe we'll roll out the uh, form to you early if we're ready. Have you go through it, makes sense for you, and we'll be beta testing with you, okay? So reach out to me. I'll give you my business card. And then July 1st is the other big date, right? That's when the funding becomes available. Um, we've already mentioned the November 1st date deadline, right? That is the deadline for commitments. If you can get in closer to May 1st, awesome, right? Because then we can get you in line for the funding. And when the funding comes available July 1st, you're already in line early, right? If you're coming in on November 1st, you're at the end of the line. So just keep that in mind, right? That's all I've got for you right now. Great questions. Hopefully I didn't make things more confusing for you. It is pretty confusing stuff. A couple more quick questions. I know, uh, Director you. Flynn, you had a question? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a feeling I might not like the answer to this question. Kevin Flynn from City and County of Denver. We recently, last year, uh, we adopted, uh, thanks to the legislature, a new mandatory affordable housing uh, ordinance. And in order to incentivize deeper affordability, we are requiring a, a smaller percentage of units if in the total project if affordability is between 30 and 60% AMI or 30% and below. That might make it harder for a city to achieve a 9% increase over, over a, the three-year period, because if we had said 80%, we could hit it easily, perhaps. Mm. But as we lower the, the percentage required, we are sort of handicapping ourselves in this process. I have a feeling this process doesn't take that sort of thing into account, So it sounds like funny math, right? But what, any thoughts on that? That's a great question, an interesting uh, problem to solve. Why don't right. you reach out to us and let's have that conversation as soon as possible and work Certainly. through that. Thank you. Uh, I suspect we can find something that works. It just may take some time to get to it. So let's start early, because we Thank don't want to lose Denver in this. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Dr. Maurer. Oh, and that's the other thing I wanted to stress. Um, and, and everybody I know so far is in agreement with this. This is going to be light touch. Right? We're here to help you, not tell you what to do, right? and say no. Right? If we can find a way to make this work, let's do it. Because it's important for everybody. Okay? And if we need to fine tune after this first three year cycle, we'll fine tune. So let's keep this flexible and moving forward. Sorry. Um, hi, Tammy Mauer, City of Centennial. Um, you know, you said it was 58 million for one year, and million for the second. Is there kind of approximation of the award amounts? No, that's the part we still have to build out, right? Um, and so, uh, so more to follow on that. I, I couldn't tell you what uh, each uh, award would look like at this time. Okay. And then are they looking for a housing authority to oversee the program? Are we looking for... Yeah, somebody to monitor to make sure there's affordable housing, meeting the... That's a great question. I think it would be up to you guys to figure out how to do that. Um, we, of course, are here to help. If there's any way we can, you know, troubleshoot that with you and come up with some ideas, we'd be more than happy to. Uh, that's a great question. It's not one I've ever heard. Uh, so not quite sure how to answer that. Uh, I would have a conversation with your housing authority. If you're I don't have one. You don't have one. <laughs> Maybe have a conversation with a neighboring one. Uh, maybe there's a potential uh, opportunity here to partner in, in that regard. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. I will definitely kick that back up and see if somebody smarter than me has a better answer for that. For one more question. Yeah, I told you, even people that knew the microphone. <laughs> it's been a minute since I have read the proposition. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the requirements around development review timelines and how that applies to what you've presented tonight? And then oh. can you talk a little bit about how um, affordable house, how our definitions of affordable housing may be different than what this program is talking about when it talks about affordable housing? Okay. Uh, so thank you. I forgot to cover actually two things. And thank you for reminding me of that. So this one question is going to be a long one. Apologies, sir. Uh, this is going to take a few minutes. So what I forgot to mention was the fast track approval, right? So you probably saw that uh, 
few paragraphs in 123 specifying that, the 90-day turnaround time, I think is what you're referring to, right? Great news on that. Don't have to worry about it for the first cycle. So those of you like Aurora who are planning on pursuing this for the first cycle, you do not have to worry about the 90-day fast-track approval for this cycle. So we're going to be working with the division of local government and all of you, and then by all of you, I mean all the municipalities and all the counties, to figure out what that looks like for the next cycle. So we've got time, mercifully, on that one. Um, so that one actually is a shorter answer. If you, you got to follow up on it, too? So? Just, just on that. So if you are in the first cycle and you do it, and then the rules about the 90-day don't appeal to you, can you opt out of the second? Hey, you, just don't submit a, you just don't submit a commitment. Yeah. But hopefully, I would like to think we'll find a way that it would still be appealing to you. That's my hope. <laughs> um, with regard to the affordable housing definition, what I forgot to mention is, because um, this question has come up quite a bit, uh, you, you can't um, uh, shrink your uh, pool uh, to just uh, subsidized housing and say that's your, your affordable housing stock that you're using for your baseline and building from. Uh, it has to also include naturally occurring affordable housing, so market rate housing. So just keep that in mind. That question has come up quite a bit. Uh, we've actually looked at the law closely. We've talked to Gary Communities, and, and they agree. You, you can't just eliminate uh, a, a part of your pool because, uh, you know, for whatever reason. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but once again, uh, the uh, definition we're working with is 60% rental, 100% ownership for affordable housing, and uh, the home can't be spending more than 30% uh, of its income towards that. So that's our starting point. Now, everything else that we've tabulated based on that and based on those other sources we've talked about, there is some room to work within, right? And that interactive uh, tabulation that I mentioned is coming out um, that we're beta testing will help you better manage that. And of course, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you guys, you've been awesome. Really appreciate you having me. Sorry for going over time. Very much for being here. Moving ahead to report of the chair, I'll have some comments in just a moment, but first we will go to the report of the finance, the, rather the uh, performance and engagement committee and uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, P&E committee met tonight right before, um, well, at five o'clock. We did have a very um, intense discussion about the board retreat agenda and have come up with a draft and made some suggestions that should be coming out to members. The date, again, um, I'm going to leave that to Director Rex if he wants to report the final date we've decided. It, is it okay to report? The final date that we decided upon is going to, and I'm gonna, it's going to be the May 12th and 13th. So you can put that down on your calendars, May 12th and 13th. That's when the board re retreat will be held. Uh, will be held here in the Dr. Cog offices. So again, that was uh, the other thing we decided was to next uh, month put on a a agenda topic to discuss um, the feasibility of continuing to have hybrid meetings. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we will go to the newest member of the executive committee, uh, Director Whitlow. Please. There you go. <laughs> See if I can make this work. Um, of course, we had uh, a great um, discussion on, uh, we had three um, action items for discussion tonight. The first one was to authorize the executive director to accept funds for uh, $80,000 from the city of Aurora to support transportation services for the older adult residents there. Uh, we also discussed um, our executive director to negotiate executive contract with EST for approximately $85,000 to begin April 1st and to terminate the end of this, on this year, 2023, for the purpose to provide infrastructure investments and Job Act IIJA grants and navigation services uh, for our region and for our member government. So that's a really good thing that we discussed and we all agreed to move forward with that. The last action item that we had was to negotiate <clears throat> for, excuse me, for uh, 
our executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with Thorn Run Partners in, in the amount of $125,000 termed at the end of March 31st, 2024, includes the option of renewal for four additional one-year terms upon satisfactory performance. And this, um, if uh, Doug wants to go into any of that, um, explaining why we went or from where we were to where we are now with Thorn Run, but we also discussed moving forward with a, a more robust, I wouldn't say more robust, but a, a more of a full shop, full shop of uh, for Dr. Cog and the region there. Uh, we also had some informational items on the um, public care workforce funds for the Federal American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, everybody's got an acronym for something. Um, we did discuss the merit and the market salaries assumptions for the 2023-24 uh, budget planning, and we all went. Um, we all discussed that would be appropriate to move forward with those, those are the, the percentages. And of course, we went through the budget status report, which is a great tool that we have now from our finance uh, director about giving us a percentage of where we are in our budget throughout the year. So thank you very much, Jenny, for doing that and your team. And Jayla, thank you for your team for the rest of the informational items tonight. Doug, did you want to speak any more about Thorn Run? Uh, I don't okay. think so. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Does anybody have any questions? All right. We had a great time. Thank you. And your chairing of that first meeting of yours was epic in terms of your ability to get through a very long agenda and keep it on time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I would ask your indulgence for a few moments while I, I, I speak. Uh, my first meeting as chair, uh, which is, is meaningful to me. Uh, I have a great belief in this organization. Uh, I represent Edgewater, which if you don't know where that is, it's immediately west of downtown Denver. It's about that big. Uh, small community, old community. Edgewater's been around for over 100 years. The surrounding community. And, uh, Lakewood and Wheat Ridge incorporated in 1969. So Edgewater could have at some point probably uh, been a little bigger had they been a little more aggressive at that <laughs> point in time. But Edgewater for a long time didn't send somebody to the table because I think their belief was as a small community there wasn't necessarily a role for Edgewater to play at this table. And I... Uh, became Edgewater's representative, we think, what, eight years ago, somewhere like that. And I've been at the table, and Edgewater's been at the table. And I strongly encourage everybody to understand being at the table is important in terms of representing your community. And I thank all of you for, for, for representing your communities. You may not get that thanks from them, but it, it's important, and I thank you for that. Um, my perception perspective comes from some of that, you know, being from a community that, that, that is small and didn't necessarily think they had the role, but we've, we've kind of exerted and figured that out and, and move forward. I'm somebody that believes in uh, regionalism because especially as a small community, you can't do it alone, but also an avid believer in local control. <laughs> and uh, we've had a lot of conversations about that. And I think this legislative session, there may be a lot more on that, but uh, uh, so I, 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 I think that's important to, to kind of know that that's from where I come uh, and I'm incredibly dedicated, incredibly thankful to this group. Uh, I see this room as a room full of mentors, a room full of, of examples, a room full of champions. You know, I think back to in the other building and, and hear the, the people that, that I sat next to and around. Lynette Kelsey, I sat next to you for a, a, a lot of meetings. Winshaw, uh, can name a, a number of folks, Ashley. Uh, I want to call it Ashley, too, because Ashley's here as, a, as an alternate tonight. Welcome back, even as an alternate. Uh, Ashley chaired this group uh, and is somebody that, of, of all the people I've dealt with, I have learned so much from, and I'm thankful that you're here, and it's kind of fun having you here tonight. Uh, but this is a, a room of people that you can connect with. I, I, I think of, of, of Herb, who, who I learned so much from, Ron Rakowski, two people that kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, you ought to do this, you ought to do this. Uh, and being in this room of champions, of mentors, is part of that. So uh, hopefully we can continue that. Uh, I had the, the pleasure this morning of hanging out with Doug and his, his staff, our staff, at Doug and Donuts. 
If you say it real fast, it sounds like a donut chain, Dugan Donuts, uh, which is a monthly uh, staff event, and, and that was, was awesome for me to, to be there and meet some staff I hadn't met. Uh, thank you to the staff. You know, Dr. Cog's staff is phenomenal, uh, and we are so fortunate to have such, such amazing people uh, that, that uh, support the mission of the body, support all of us as communities, support regionalism, and, and we thank you for that. Again, thank you to all of you as, as electeds for being here and, and, and as for the alternates. That's incredibly important. I want to thank the executive committee, who you, you, you met two of just now, uh, Wynne Shaw, who was vice chair, uh, phenomenal, and look forward to, to you kicking me out of the seat. <laughs> and want to thank Kevin Flynn. Uh, Kevin Flynn uh, is our immediate past chair. Kevin is somebody that, that I knew distantly by reading him in the paper, by seeing him in his TV appearances on, on public affairs programming. Uh, I had the, the, the opportunity to sit with Kevin and his wife at one of our in-person retreats and, and got to know Kevin more at that time. And, and it's been an honor serving on the board with you. Uh, I don't know how I'll do following you, but I thank you for your service. Perfect. He's also a published author, and that's pretty cool. Sometime we'll hear those. And stories. a movie deal. Movie. There we go. <laughs> movie deal. And he has a movie deal for his book. So I didn't know how public that was, but, but uh, uh, that's very, very, very cool. Uh, and then just a, a, a moment of personal privilege. Um, we all have lost people and had lost in the past several years through COVID in our lives. And, you know, during COVID, I lost my father. I think this group may have known that. Um, I lost a friend this weekend that is somebody that actually indirectly powered my involvement in Dr. Cog. Uh, a friend that lived in Littleton, worked in Denver, took rapid transit, was dependent on rapid transit. I've never been dependent on rapid transit. I learned a lot from having somebody that I knew that was dependent on that. And we had so many conversations uh, about that. Uh, it's somebody that I would have called after the meeting tonight and said, I only mispronounced three names. <laughs> Speaking of names, if your name tag isn't facing me, if you could, as we move in, that will be helpful. And I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations. But anyway, I was flying to, to LA to celebrate this person's birthday uh, because they had relocated to LA and three days before their birthday day. So the trip to LA became a, a very different trip. But it's a reminder to let people know you appreciate them. That's why I'm telling you all I appreciate you and appreciate your work. Tell the people in your life that you love and care about and, and mean something to you and mentor you about that because it's, thank you. Oh, thanks, you. Uh, wow. Um, if I was a smart man, I would just, uh, I'd, I'd say I have no comment and just I have no executive director's report tonight because I can't, can't, can't uh, uh, follow that, but uh, I'm, I'm not a smart man and I do have a couple things I want to mention to you. <laughs> So with regards, and, but I will be quick on this, and it's great seeing everybody, and I want to say that. It's great seeing everybody. So look, I'm Wednesday without snow, so I thought, until I talked to Director Mornis from Gilpin and uh, Director Williams from Central City, and it's snowing up there, so, and it's coming this way probably. So, yay. <laughs> Um, so we got that going for us. I, there's a couple things I do want to mention. At your, at your seat, there was a couple flyers that I want you to be aware of, um, most notably the, uh, the Dr. Cog Award celebration. We do have a location and, um, and date for that now, and it is on, when is it? A, October 4th, I believe. I can see, yeah, October 4th at the Sewell Ballroom. Ballroom. So I'm sure it's, it's a place that you're all familiar with, great location. We're really excited about it, especially the change in, in, um, in the season for us. We typically have had that in the spring, and uh, we've had some weather issues associated with it in the spring. So I think hopefully we'll be safe come October 4th. And so we're looking forward to that. also want to draw your attention to the other uh, flyer that was there related to our, our Dr. Cog Civic Academy. 
Um, if you know anybody that you think that might be interested in participating in this seven-week event here at Dr. Cog, it's free for, for that individual. Um, we would welcome them to come just to learn a little bit more about the regional issues that, that we all face in this region and helping them become a little more engaged and knowledgeable about the process. So if you have, uh, you know, you have pub folks from the public that show up at your meetings periodically you think might be a good fit for this, please just reach out and uh, we'll be sure to get them hooked up. Um, the uh, uh, annual board retreat we did, as, as uh, Director Baker mentioned, had a conversation at the Performance Engagement Committee tonight. So it will be at Dr. Cog offices at, on the 12th and 13th of May. We will send out a calendar invite tomorrow morning to you all. So you have that on your calendars. We'll also send out a calendar invite for the award celebration too, so you have that. Um, we're excited about it. We had a conversation about the, the agenda. I think it's coming together rather well. So Friday night will be primarily dedicated. It will be social event stuff, right? So we'll have a social and we'll have a sit down dinner somewhere in a downtown location, whether it be a hotel, restaurant, whatever. Um, so we're excited about that opportunity. Speaking of annual uh, retreats, uh, you might recall last year that we had a conversation about our exploration and seeking uh, economic development district status with the um, economic development, uh, is that administration, EDA? Administration. Or agency. Administration? Okay. Economic Development Administration, the feds. Um, and part of the reason we were doing that because we, we were under the, we were, it was the understanding that that would open up some grant opportunities for our member local governments. And um, so we've since learned, we're still interested in that for sure, but we, we have since learned that, um, that in order to open up those grants, flow sh not if I'm saying this correctly, that, um, that we, we don't have to become designated an EDD, but we, if we were to create the, the SEDS or the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy, which is a precursor to becoming an, e uh, a, 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 um, an EDD, we can we can just go that route. So we're very interested in, in exploring that now. And um, I know we've had conversations with several of your staffs about that. We're going to continue to do that, um, and all of course in hope of uh, kind of you know opening the door to additional economic development opportunities for for you all. So stay tuned on that. And I'm just summing through here, and I think that is it for me tonight. I will. The other thing I will mention is the is the budget so that where this is budget time for Dr. Cog. We run on the state fiscal year. So staff is very busy in putting that uh, budget together for discussion at performance and or sorry, at finance and budget committee. Um, you all, the full board will see that um, uh, recommended budget at your May meeting. So um, please, if you can attend that meeting, be more appreciative than ever, because we have to adopt it according to our Articles of Association. So thank you, sir, so very much. I really do appreciate your comments earlier about uh, about small government, small uh, small communities. That is the genius of what Dr. Cog is, right? Regardless of your size of your community, you have a seat at this table, and it's a and a true genius is that it is a forum for discussion and debate, that conversations that we don't have as a collective very very often, and we have the privilege of doing that once twice a month. And I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Pat, it is time for public comment. We have up to 45 minutes allocated for public comment. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting. To, uh, the chair requests that there be no public comment on issues on which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last year. Our first speaker is at the podium. Good evening. I'm Randall Loeb. I've appeared here a few times. Thank you for being here. Yeah, and, and I wanted to piggyback on what you said. I used to actually live in Edgewater on Benton Street, but that's not what I wanted to piggyback on. The significance of the ordinary citizen participating in this is as paramount as the managers and the uh, mayors and the other dignitaries that are here in this room. And so we need to partner e with each other because one of the things I would have added to his uh, presentation, and I thought it was excellent, by the way, and I'm sort of a connoisseur of that stuff, uh, is rent stabilization. 
We really need to work on how we can keep affordability really affordable for those people who are aging like myself and many others who are disabled. And of course, there are many others like my dear friend who um, was uh, if in jail and as a result of a felon, can't figure out where he can go and live. And he's a very talented young man. He's like one third of my age. And it really pains me to see these difficulties, these barriers that exist in our communities uh, and how it is that we can overcome them and make it possible for us to work out how we can live together. And so I'm going to recommend something which you may think is a, a, a very far afield, but I looked at a film that was recommended to me by my therapist named Stutz on Netflix in October of last year. It was produced by Jonah Hill, the comedian actor, and his therapist he had been um, taking advantage of for over 30 years and decided to look at the 10 tools dealing with visualization and how it is that we can live a more peaceful existence than the one that we live helter-skelter in this particular time. And as a person with a mental illness who has suffered from it since I was born, uh, I can say for sure that all of us, regardless of our circumstances, have tremendous difficulties in functioning or of feeling shame or some loss. And there are many ways that we can overcome them. And I'm a prime example of that. So it is with great honor that I address you, have that privilege, but also I think it's a privilege that goes both ways. And so thank you for listening. Thank you very much. There is no one online, and I here, so we will move forward. Moving to the consent agenda, uh, asking for a motion to approve the consent agenda, which is minutes of our February 15th, 2023 virtual meeting and revisions to the committee guidelines for the uh, ACA. I hate acronyms. Advisory Committee on Aging, Regional Transportation Committee, and Transportation, Transportation Advisory Committee, E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> so moved. Uh, Director Teal, a second from uh, Director Pawlowski. And any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. And any abstention? Very much. We move forward. Action items. Our first action item is a discussion of the policies for fiscal year 2024-2027 TIP Transportation Improvement Program. Set aside program. And with that, I will introduce Josh Schwenk, Planner for Transportation Planning and Operations. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as the chair mentioned, my name is Josh Schwenk. I'm a planner here at Dr. Cog. Uh, here to talk to you about our policy guidelines for our upcoming set-aside programs. So just to situate us, um, our set-aside programs are part of our Transportation Improvement Program, that short-range funding program for the region, uh, which is really how we devote money to projects that are helping to make way towards that vision that we've all established for our region in MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan. So what exactly is a TIP set-aside? Well, many of you are probably overly aware with our regular TIP calls for projects process. We're uh, wrapping up our fourth call for projects in uh, the past year. Um, but if you remember all the way back in January of last year, uh, the board passed a TIP policy document to help to guide that whole process. Um, within that TIP policy document, uh, bit of funding was taken off the top of the funding available for those calls for projects and set aside for particular uses. Um, all of those programs are defined in the TIP policy and the amount of funding going towards them. Many of those set-aside programs hold their own calls for projects, um, and that's what we are here to discuss today. So we do have eight uh, set-aside programs. Uh, the four um, on the 
kind of top row, um, regional transportation operations and technology, air quality improvements, human services transportation, and transportation demand management are uh, long-standing set-asides that have existed in our prior TIPS. Uh, those four on the bottom that are in shades of blue are grouped together as those are new set-asides uh, that were included for the first time in our upcoming TIP. So transportation corridor planning is really looking at uh, corridor studies along priority corridors throughout the region. That is being, excuse me, that is being piloted right now. Um, the community-based transportation planning set aside is also currently being piloted. That's really looking at working with community-based organizations on transportation plans that center marginalized communities. Our livable center small area planning is a new program uh, that is looking at the intersection of land use and transportation in community centers and nodes. Um, and then the innovative mobility set aside is looking at studies and pilots uh, that look at innovative technologies and solutions to our mobility challenges. So in the past, each of these eight set asides would have brought forward their own policy guideline document through our committees and board for approval prior to holding their own calls for projects. Um, this process worked but it resulted in information only being available just before a call for projects opened, and it resulted in information being available in inconsistent formats, um, some information not being available for some programs that was available for others. So what we've brought to you tonight is a single policy document that incorporates information on all eight of the programs. Um, each is provided in its own separate section, uh, so it's not that you have to read the entire quite lengthy document. Uh, you can skip to the specific program that you're interested in, but this will help to standardize the information available across all eight of the programs and hopefully streamline that process of opening a call for projects because the set-aside will not need to come before this body again. They will have that standing policy that's already adopted um, and can move forward with opening a call for projects. So I'm not going to go through each of these, but just wanted to give you a taste of the types of things that are available um, in terms of the information that's presented for each of the set-aside programs. We've tried to keep this standardized as much as possible, recognizing that the programs are different, different information needs to be included for each one, but as much as possible, we wanted a standard structure so that uh, the document was relatively easy to navigate for applicants when they were looking for specific information. So as I mentioned, there is a separate section for each of the eight programs in the document. So if you're only interested in one uh, program, you can just go to that. If you're interested in multiple programs, the standardized structure should allow you to easily find uh, the information you're interested in uh, within each section. Um, we've also worked to try to standardize application processes, again, as much as possible across the different programs. So. Uh, starting with a training, moving on to letter of intent, application, et cetera. Um, of course, once a call for projects occurs, uh, the actual project selection will be brought through our committees and to this board uh, for final selection. And if there are any changes to the policy prior to the opening of a call for projects, that will be brought through the committees and board as well as an amendment to this document. So finally, I just wanted to present this. Um, this is a very high-level schedule that is available in the document, uh, really looking at kind of six-month uh, chunks of time, but at least it provides kind of that planning level um, schedule so that potential applicants can see roughly when a call for projects might be opening for each of the programs. We do intend to have a much more detailed schedule available on our website as time moves on and we're able to get those specific dates. And of course, we'll send out information about any call for projects opening through all of our usual channels. So with that, I do have a proposed motion for you, but I'd also be uh, very happy to take any questions the board may have. Questions? Questions, do we have a motion? Dr. Flynn making a motion. Second. Second. Looking over here, so Director Pawlowski with the second. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed, nay. Attention. There we go. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, next, discussion on state legislative issues, bills in which positions have pre previously been taken. Rich Morrow, Director of Legislative Affairs. Come on down. Um, I thought I'd, we have a couple of bills to just give you updates on, but before that, because there might be some additional conversation on those, I wanted to just take a minute to uh, introduce again our contract lobbyists, uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, uh, just to make a couple comments uh, about a few things going on at the uh, Capitol these days. We just passed halfway through the session, and we're going to see some budget talks and some other things going on. So. Uh, yeah. If you may, um, Ed and Jen, take it over for a few minutes. Thank you, Rich. I'll start off. Good evening, everybody. Happy day 66 with 54 to go. But who's counting? Um, we just passed the halfway point of the legislative session. The big issue for the next few weeks is the budget. The Legislative Joint Budget Committee, which includes the six members, include a bunch of members who were local government officials in the Dr. Cog region. Um, the six members of the Joint Budget Committee are finalizing their budget recommendations. Tomorrow they get the quarterly revenue estimates where they will receive information on the inflation rate for the state, general fund revenues, TABOR refunds, all of those things, all the data they need to finish their budgeting decisions. The long bill will then be introduced in the Senate on Monday, March 27th. That's the plan. Um, that will take up a week in the Senate and then the next week over in the House. So this is, we're getting right into budget season. The big issue for the legislature with regard to the budget is property taxes. I think everything relates to property taxes for the legislature. That's because on May 1st, you will all get your notice of valuation. Every property owner in the state on or about gets their notice of valuation. The average change in the residential notice of evaluation statewide is roughly a 25% increase over the previous two years. That's the average change. If you live in higher income areas, if you own a house in, up in the mountains, it's likely to be much more than that. Um, the legislature knows last year, the legislature put together a couple of bills late in the session that modified the assessment rates, the residential assessment rate and the non-residential assessment rate. It is likely there will be some action to do this yet this session. It relates directly to the budget because those strong gains in residential assessment in particular, also non-residential assessment, those strong gains will fund school finance. And so the legislature needs to find a balance if they're going to provide some sort of property tax relief. Do they do it by expanding the homestead exemption? Do they do it by providing um, changes in the assessment rates, all of those things will impact school finance. And school finance is roughly between 35 and 40% of the budget, so you've got to figure that out to have the rest of the budget fall into place. So those are two of the issues that are going to take a lot of time over the next two months. The budget and the property tax issue, if they decide to weigh into the property tax issue. Um, so those are kind of two things that we look forward to updating you on. I'll turn the rest over to Jennifer. Thank you, Ed. The fun continues, right? Um, so as it relates to some policy issues, um, I believe most of you are probably aware of the uh, governor's land use proposal, right? Um, I know that Doug has uh, been speaking to this for the past couple of board meetings, and we have been at the table. We've been engaged in those conversations, which has been great. Really, at this point, it's all rumors and so much speculation. Um, there's not too many details that are known um, for what's to come in the governor's proposal. Uh, we, we believe it's going to be introduced next week, though we did hear that it was going to be introduced this week. Um, so really, again, you know, rumors, but we do think we are, we're getting close, um, and I know that a draft is going to be circulated at least at the end of this week. So, again, very general kind of vague concepts that we know will likely be included. Um, the, the proposal is going to make local governments do something. Not sure what that is as of yet, but 
but it will force us to do something. And there's going to be more focus on municipalities than counties. There's going to be a focus on ADUs, accessory dwelling units. There's going to be a focus on creating more affordable housing around, around transit corridors. And there could very well be a focus on limiting growth caps. Um, you know, certain cities, Boulder, Golden, Lakewood, that have instituted growth caps. Um, so there could, there could be something to address that as well. Again, it's kind of all speculation and hearsay at the moment, um, but there, are, there have been more stakeholder meetings on it. Again, we've been included in those conversations and we'll, we'll remain included and um, engaged on those conversations as that one moves forward. In addition, there's going to be a lot of you know, issue-related legislation, hot topics, if you will, that are, that are going to still be debated. We had our first overnight debate last week on Thursday. It was an 18-hour debate, um, mostly on gun, gun control measures, right? As Ed and I were walking into the Capitol on Friday morning, they were leaving the Capitol. Um, and then we also had the first Saturday session as well, too. Last Saturday was their first um, weekend session. And we imagine there's going to be more to come right there. Um, they continue to debate some of these gun control measures as well as some um, abortion measures as well. Also some environmental related issues are going to get a lot of attention. As Ed mentioned, we have 54 days left of the legislative session. There's always going to be surprises, right? Um, we don't fully know exactly what's going to be introduced in the last 54 days, but it's going to be a wild ride, so we gotta hang on, right? Thank you, any comments or questions? Otherwise I can I'll go into the bills. Um, so I guess the good news I, I, is that we actually didn't have any new bills for me to present to you that got introduced in the last month. I doubt that'll be the case next month. So, um, but, uh, and a number of these, as you can see with the first two in Senate appropriations, they've, they've been like passed out of committee and gone to appropriations and just been sitting there once the long bill and the budget gets finalized next week, uh, we'll start seeing a lot of these bills scheduled uh, and heard uh, and hopefully move through the process. So um, let me see, is this moving? Is it? No, I thought it was moving. I was going to scroll. Can you help me? <laughs> Did I turn it off? Oh, that one? I just don't have the time. Um, and the same thing with this one, another one This is in appropriations. Um, I think the next couple, um, we've had uh, some conversations among the board on. With Senate Bill 16, again, um, the bill um, it passed out of committee, but it has not been taken up yet. There's a lot of uh, interested parties in this bill, um, various different aspects uh, of its uh, provisions dealing with greenhouse gases and so forth. Our issue with the um, uh, greenhouse gas targets, we still haven't gotten resolution on that yet. Uh, I don't know if Doug wants to say anything. We've, we've had some conversations on it. Yeah, we have. Thank you, Rich, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, yeah, we have had some conversation with that. Just to refresh your memories, the concern we had with it was that, as you all know, we just went to a pretty laborious process of updating our regional transportation plan to um, to accommodate the, the uh, transportation planning rule that uh, CDOT's transportation greenhouse gas rule. Um, and we were concerned when we saw interim targets associated with this um, as it relates to greenhouse gas rule, as well as the, the, the 2050 goal of a, at 100% because the current structure is 90%, Ron? right now. So we had concerns about that we would have to open up our regional transportation plan again and go through that entire process with more, with more targets that we would have to hit. So, um, so I've had some conversations with various state departments and the simple fact is if this, if this law, bill does pass, there will have to be an update to the state's greenhouse reduction roadmap first and then um, whether we would have to then update, uh, whether the greenhouse gas rule would then have to be uh, opened back up um, is yet to be determined, but I think probably so specifically as it relates to the 2050 goal. So it looks like it's a ways out anyway. We're still trying to get 
confirmation and clarification for some folks because I think, quite frankly, the question kind of caught some folks off guard. So we're we're still working through that. Thank you. Hey, all right. So I I lost it again. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, could we have a question. Yeah, and that one. Um, my question relates to the insurance part, which is relevant to our new focus on housing. Affordable housing is important, and we just went through the Marshall Fire, and we're going through a tax valuation increase because property valuations are increasing. So the affordability of insurance relates directly to the affordability of housing. And so that's why the first item on that list in the second column is important. It requires all insurance companies to fill out this survey for whether or not their investments comply with um, certain requirements. Basically to say if an insurance company has investments, what do their investments do? So it's not what the insurance company does, it's where they invest their money. And the doing that survey is rather expensive, and right now only a quarter of the states have provide for it and less than that actually require it. And so we would be in the minority requiring it, but it would actually increase the cost of insurance. So I wonder if we, if there is a flavor in this body to promote the affordability of housing by reducing the cost of insurance and reducing this item, which probably has very little direct impact on the environment. Um, it does not change what the insurance company does itself because the insurance company itself really is not having an impact on gas emissions, but it will directly affect the pocketbooks of people there any discussion about that at the Capitol? Um, I think there there was discussion of it at the committee hearing, that, but I haven't been in you know, directly involved in any of the other conversations. Rich. Yes, Jen. Sorry, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have been involved in some of those conversations, and that was actually a compromise um, from last year's bill. Most, if not all, of the current insurance companies already submit that information. So if there would be some sort of financial impact to the insurance um, companies, carriers, it'd be negligible. But I understand that point. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, whoa, well, I jumped too far. All right. So the next bill, um, House Bill 1101, um, is the bill that uh, extends the uh, free fair day that, uh, for transit agencies. And the board had uh, concerns about the uh, provision uh, regarding representation on the uh, of the transit agencies on the, the MPOs and the other transportation or transportation planning organizations. Uh, we did have a conversation with the bill spon uh, Senate bill sponsor, uh, actually uh, Senator Winter, uh, about. Our process here at Dr. Cog with the MPO and the Regional Transportation Commission and so forth, um, being already in compliance with the provisions of the bill, and she agreed with us that that her intent um, was um, adequately considered in in our existing process. Uh, so we were we were pleased to hear that. Doug, did you have any other thing you wanted to add on that? No, I, I, Rich is exactly right. Just, I mean, again, to refresh your memories, you might, um, you know, we've talked about that our process is a little different than some of the, you know, more traditional transportation planning regions, right? That we have, you know, we're a council of governments. We, we actually, you know, we do, you know, our business is more than just transportation. So, um, so we had, so our MPO process, our metropolitan planning process, that um, is is a little unique too, in that we have a regional transportation committee, which is um, has membership for uh, RTD, CDOT, Dr. Cog, as well as some other special interests. But predominantly, those three entities and any position or action or recommendation that they take at that level, the Dr. Cog board must take the exact same action, or it goes back to RTC for consideration. So right now, our process is actually. Um, to Rich's point, um, you know, the clarification we got from Senator Winter is that that 
that complies with what her intent of that that um, that section three was is that quite frankly they have a stronger voice in our process than what they would have if they were one of 58 or 59 or whatever right so um, and we've talked we've had conversations with RTD about this they they agree with that with that interpretation and um, they'll be stating such at a at a later date. Thank you. And um, apparently there's a different issue now that, ha that has arisen ah. with that bill uh, to the point where the um, it had already passed the Senate. And when it came up for uh, um, back to the House for concurrence with the Senate amendments, they were rejected and the House requested a conference committee. So this bill will now go to a conference committee. Well, let me talk about that a little bit because you may have heard a little bit about this, this amendment. And so on, in the Senate committee, there was, a, there was an amendment that was, a, that was tacked on to this related to um, uh, representation on the State Transportation Advisory Committee, or the STAC. And we have membership on that. Uh, Director Williams serves as our member, and, and Director Teal serves as our alternate on that. That there, um, to give basically the Transportation Commission the authority to go in and actually um, uh, make some some reorganization of the the membership of that or the representation of within within STAC, uh, it was it was accepted unanimously in the committee, right, Rich? Um, but then it kind of blew up a little bit. Um, rural Colorado. And some of the TPRs in the rural parts of the state um, were not too pleased with the amendment because they, I think, they were concerned about how that would affect their representation on the stack. So anyway, so it kind of blew up a little bit. So it went to to the House floor, and as Rich said, is now in conference committee. And uh, there is some some amended language, or sorry, revisions to that that amendment that has been floating around. And um, we'll see what's next. But um, I will tell you, you know, listen, it's no, it be no shock, and I, no one would be shocked to hear me say this, that the State Transportation Advisory Committee is very rural dominated. There's no doubt. It's 15 TPRs serve on that, um, and we're one of 15 on the, on that on that committee. We represent, of course, 50 percent of the population of the state. So there are questions associated with that. I will tell you, we had nothing to do with that amendment. Because I said, as soon as I heard it, I'm like, oh, my God, we're going to get blamed for this. Yeah. No, so I, did I, not. I was at, you know, listening to the committee when I heard, heard, heard the amendment being presented, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. I better email Doug and Rod <laughs> and see what they think of this. So anyway, we're following it very closely, obviously, with, uh, with, uh, with our own thoughts, and, and but we'll keep you apprised of any, any, uh, any further action on that. Thank you. All right, and with that, I think the other, the rest of the bills, nothing really has changed on them. If I can get here, we had a couple of uh, of uh, housing bills, and um, I think the one transportation bill, they're they're moving along. I think I can do that. Yeah, yeah, that one uh, has already moved over to the Senate. It's almost done, and then the House bills are finished. So unless there's any other comments or questions from folks. Uh, I will. Yes, Director Flynn. Thank you, Rich. Is it clear in uh, in uh, Winter's bill that our RTC structure? It's her intent, but sometimes when you go down the road, uh, that gets lost in the actual literal words of the. Of yeah. No. I mean, it's a great question, and I think that's that's part of the you know, the conversation we want. So at the last meeting, if you recall, at least in the chat, um, Director Brian Welsh from RTD uh, said in there they, they agree with staff with the, you know, uh, out as to our interpretation of, of, of the, uh, and how it complies with the, with the bill. Good Lord, I don't know what I'm saying here. But anyway, so, so basically, you know, we ha we've had further conversations with RTD about that, and they are willing to speak on record as to the um, uh, that they concur with our understanding of what it is, and, and just the, the language of the bill itself it, in the under staff comments sort of covers it if you want if you if you want to interpret it that way because it's it's trying to be comprehensive as to what the governing body of the transportation planning organization would be. So whether it, it and it talks about 
um, board of directors, then it just says committee or other governing body, however named. Ours happens to be See. board of directors and regional transportation committee. So, you know, our first reaction was, yeah, we're covered. We got it. But um, Doug, Doug's right that we it just felt like it would be good to kind of get that proactively. Certainly. It's, it's easier to interpret specific language yeah. than to infer unspecific <laughs> language. Thank you. The questions? Thank you. Moving ahead to informational briefings, uh, item number 12, RTD system-wide fair study and equity analysis, something that I think we've all been anticipating. Uh, we will introduce Jacob Rieker, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations, to introduce Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have the easiest job here. I'm just going to introduce our presenter. But as I think most of you know, RTD has been engaged for about a year now in a very comprehensive fair study and equity analysis. As they get close to the end, we thought this would be a really good time to give you a briefing on that study um, and the direction it's heading. So it's my pleasure yeah, to introduce Chris Quinn, uh, Planning Project Manager with RTD. Chris, thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, as Jacob said, I'm Chris Quinn. I'm a, a, a project manager in the planning department, and we appreciate the opportunity to address this group tonight. We're very excited about where we are in the process of the FAIR study. Um, just a couple of overarching things before we get into it. Um, I think any of you who have been around any amount of time know that we have there have been a lot of complaints, justifiably, about the complexity and the cost of the RTD system. Our own general manager, who 25-plus year veteran of the industry, she said that when she came here for her interview, got to the airport, she couldn't figure out which ticket she was supposed to buy. So it became a very high priority of hers to, to take a close look at this. So here we are. Oh, thank you. I don't have to do the Phil Donahue thing. Okay, but yeah, let me know if I am kind of fading out. The overarching goal of the study is equity. Um, we, want, we really want to make sure, and I think we've done a pretty good job of trying to address the concerns of our low-income and minority customers. One of the big, I mean, just on its own, very important, but also, especially since the pandemic, we've seen a lot of changes in our ridership, specifically, a lot we our core ridership now with you know with so many workers uh, working virtually we've lost a lot of commuters and our core ridership base at this point really uh, consists very much of low income and minority riders so we really wanted to make sure that we drilled down and make sure that the cons we got concerns from those groups and then obviously as I mentioned before um, you know we've heard quite a bit in the past that our fares are just too high. And then simplicity, people just can't figure the system out. Which zone are they supposed to ride? Get, you know, which zone are they supposed to pay for if they're riding light rail for any considerable distance, they're riding a regional bus from Boulder, and they're getting off halfway. I've worked for the system a long time. I can't even tell you without looking at the website on a lot of these. So, you know, that's, those are the goals. As Jacob indicated, we've been working on this for about a year now, or at least on the public face of it. Um, we had our first round of public engagement back in April of last year, and at that time it was really just sort of introducing the study to the public, almost kind of a scoping, what do you like about the system, what do you dislike, uh, those sorts of questions. And then we came back for what we were calling our second milestone, and that was in the June-July time frame, where we started introducing very high-level concepts of just trying to get a better gauge of what people would like to see in uh, in a new fare structure. Then we developed uh, two alternatives that we presented to the public on what we were calling our milestone number three, and that was in the fall of last year. Um, so we've taken the feedback that we received on the two alternatives, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, and kind of formu formulated a final alternative that we'll be bringing out to the public uh, this spring. 
Our hope is to go to uh, the board in the July timeframe, and I'll talk about a couple of the interim steps in a few slides later. But our hope is to get uh, to the board in July, seek their final approval, and, that, and if that's the case, then we'd be able to begin implementation in the first quarter of next year. Not going to go through all of the particular items on this slide, but a couple of things that I do want to emphasize, as I mentioned earlier, really it was very important for us to make sure that we were hearing from voices that you know, traditionally are not heard in the public involvement process. And a couple of the ways we did this, um, some unique things that we had never done before, one of which was you see in the upper right-hand corner there, we actually contracted with community-based organizations, recognizing the fact that a lot of them don't have the resources to just work, well, just, so to speak, do RTD's work and trying to reach out to people. But we, we knew that they, you know, they have direct contact with all of their client populations and their, their members. So we actually contracted with several organizations to help get out the word to their communities. We also had uh, down in the lower left, the opposite side, there's the lower uh, left-hand corner, we established three feedback panels, one of which was an equity feedback panel, another was a group comprised of uh, local jurisdictions, and then another one for employers uh, and the colleges to focus on past programs. Now, this slide shows um, up on the, the top in red our, fur, our current fare structure, and then there below that are the two alternatives that we went out to the public with um, last fall. Alternative A simply keeps the, the existing fare structure as it is, so there's still the local, the regional, and the airport fares. However, it reduces all of the fares in, in all of the categories. The second alternative, alternative B, is what we called kind of the flat fare structure. So it eliminated the regional fare um, so that any bus or train you get on, with the exception of the airport, you would pay a flat fare no matter how far you are going. Based on the feedback that we heard from the public, uh, the public really, in, we had a survey out, uh, our public meetings, um, our feedback panels. For the most part, a majority of our respondents uh, stated a preference for alternative B just due to the simplicity of it. However, we did have a lot of concerns that the costs weren't really going to go down for the local customers who make up the, the core of our ridership. So we came up with, we developed an alternative B, which does in fact lower, lower the fares uh, while also keeping the flat fare structure. So with the exception of the airport, any service you get on, you would be paying $2.75. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on what this looks like without going through all the, the numbers here. Uh, this shows side by side on the left, the current fare structure, and then uh, the, the proposed fare structure, what we have been calling for a while, our modified alternative B. A couple of things to note there, uh, we, we show the full fare and we show the discount fare. The discount fare is for seniors, disabled, uh, and anyone on the LIVE program, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment as well. One of the big things to note, uh, the, if you look at the very bottom row, the monthly pass, currently for the regional and airport, that comes in at, about, is a, at $200. This proposal would lower that to $88 a month. Then likewise, uh, I'll focus on pretty much the exact same thing with the airport. Uh, current fare, 1050, we would propose lowering that to $10. But the monthly pass, so those who are using it uh, on a daily basis or for airport employees, that cost would go from $200 down to $88. And then below that, you see in parentheses that nine times, that would mean one would only have to use it nine times, uh, ride nine times before they would have break even, 
thank you, wherever that came from, since I was struggling with that. Uh, you'd, you'd, be, you'd hit your break-even point there. Something else to mention, and I always hate explaining this because I never quite clearly articulated as well as it should be. Um, we've also in, uh, established fair capping uh, as of last October. So if you do have, uh, if you do buy an electronic monthly pass, um, or excuse me, not even a monthly, if you have an, el an electronic account with us, it will automatically accrue the rides you have taken. So even if you haven't bought a monthly pass, once you hit, if say if you were an airport employee, once you hit that number nine, then all of the rides for your, your rides for the remainder of the month would then be free without having to purchase the pass, since we know that there are a lot of people that don't have the money, even the $88, to come up with at the beginning of the month. Uh, big thing with accessoride fares, uh, you can see by category how they, they play out, but the big thing is the very last column, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about this in a moment as well, um, in the past there has not been a live discount. The live program is our low income program, uh, which provides currently a 40% discount, and we were raising that to 50, we were proposing raising that to 50%, again, I'll talk about that in a second, but we are also proposing introducing live fares for the accessoride program, so it's not just the base system. And then, to that extent, um, as far as our uh, various uh, programs that are out there, the, the LIVE program, again, is a low-income program. Currently, the eligibility is if you are um, at 185% or below the federal poverty level, you are eligible for the LIVE discount. We are proposing raising that up to 250%. Uh, here again, you know, knowing that the cost of living has gone up dramatically, especially in the metro area. And then one of the uh, concerns that has that have been uh, expressed to us, especially as we were doing our outreach, and this was something we kind of already knew, is our own numbers indicate that there are, from our ridership surveys, indicate that there are a lot of people that are eligible for the discount that are not taking advantage of it. So we intend to really market this a lot more, a lot stronger. Um, reach out to our community partners to help us with uh, help us, uh, you know, get the word out on it. And in addition to that, currently to determine eligibility, one must apply through the Colorado Peak system. So they do our determination for us. It's not. An extremely difficult process, but it is not easy e either. We currently do contract with Denver Human Services uh, to help with the, uh, to help applicants get through the process. What we'd like to do is expand that to other uh, charitable organizations as well to work with their client populations, just to make it easier uh, for people to get into the system. And here again, since we know that there are a lot more people eligible for it than are taking advantage of it. Other programs, um, the EcoPass, uh, many of you, I'm thinking most of you are probably aware of what the EcoPass is. That's a business pass, that's a pass that businesses can buy for their, uh, for their employees. It's the insurance model, so the employer must buy it for all of the employees within the organization. Similarly, we have the Nico Pass, which is kind of the neighborhood version of that, and there's a college pass, which the college uh, version of that. So all of, in the case of say Auraria, Auraria buys. I think it comes out of their student fee. So, but the, through the college, the all of the students have a college pass that can be used on the system. One of the uh, things that we've heard uh, from a lot of businesses is that the pricing changes every year. It's hard for people to budget uh, what they are going to need. So we. With this in mind, we're uh, going to fix the price so in two-year increments so that it's a little less volatile. And then also, one of the bigger things, if the system itself is a little bit complicated in the uh, EcoPass, we have this whole matrix based on what we call SLAs or service level areas. They're basically zones where the business is located, and then that is crossed, uh, crossed against uh, how many employees are in the business, 
we're trying to simplify that, lowering the number of employees, uh, ca- uh, kind of combining the categories so that it's a little simpler to determine what the pricing would be for any given business or organization. And then other programs that we have under consideration. The big one that's uh, garnered a lot of attention is Zero Fare for Youth program. What we'd like to do is establish a one-year pilot with the hope of, over time, seeing if we could uh, find some partners to help us with the funding of that. We think at this point that it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4 to $5 million annually that would be needed to keep the program going. Um, and then also a couple of other things, uh, looking at a transit assistant gr- assistance grant uh, for, those, uh, char- for charitable organizations that have client populations that may need transit services immediately. Uh, and don't have time to go through the application process for the live uh, through the live program. As an example, uh, homeless shelters, uh, centers for domestic violence, uh, it, so that they are able to give out a pass immediately to their uh, to their clients. And then, on the, in the case of the colleges, the current colleges that participate in the uh, college fast programs are the ones you would. Guess University of Denver, CU Boulder, Auraria. Simply, they have good transit connections, uh, more traditional students. But we've also heard from a lot of community colleges and technical schools that, while they'd like to be able to participate, uh, given the you know the fact that they have non-traditional students, the college pass just does not work for them. So we would like to introduce a semester pass. It would be an opt-in program for those students who wanted to participate and then design that around either a semester or a quarter, uh, depending on the nature of the, uh, of the school itself. So we, will be, we went to the board with this modified, uh, the RTD board in the, with this modified option last month. We received uh, mostly positive feedback on this. We were making a few very minor changes based on some of the comments that we did receive. We will be going back to the uh, board in April with an update, uh, and then with the intent of going out to the public in the late April, May to June timeframe. And as I said earlier, the intent would then be to go back to the RTD board in July, requesting approval of the final um, of the final uh, recommendation. And then, with that in mind, uh, implementation would start uh, probably in the first quarter. Of next year. So happy to try to address any questions, concerns, comments that anyone might have. Dr. Flynn. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. How have you been? Very good. Thank Question. Has RTD come up with a, any projections for ridership? Yeah. Changes. And, uh, we, we do have a slide that I, we did show to the board, and we ended up taking it out of this one just because it it starts to get a little bit complicated, but a couple of things that, that, that your question prompts a bigger answer maybe. Uh, going into this, one of the great things that we had going for us that we didn't have in previous, uh, previously when we have conducted fair studies is we didn't go into it with a specific revenue target um, or specific you know, fares have to still come in at X number of million dollars per year. Uh, we did have some parameters that were established by our finance department, but a little bit of flexibility. We would expect with the recommendation that the riders, or excuse me, that the fair, uh, we would lose about 20% of our fair revenue. However, since the pandemic, our, our what we call our fair box recovery ratio or the amount of ser- that service, the amount of that fair, fairs cover of the operating costs has gone down significantly. Um, so we would, would assume it an additional loss there. However, we would also, um, it, we would see some fairly significant increases in ridership, but, and I know this question always comes up, not enough to offset the loss in revenue. So it, there would be a loss in fare box revenue, but it would not be m- completely made up by the increases in ridership. So I'm, maybe Dr. Sure. Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. I stated some of these comments yesterday at the uh, Transportation Committee meeting and here. Uh, 
Um, I would have liked to have seen RTD switch to a flat fare, like its peer throughout the country, uh, instead of having one for the airport, considering most airport employees, I am an RTD operator and I drive to those routes, uh, use passes, either EcoPass or have a monthly pass, and since you're cutting the monthly pass down to the local fare anyways, it really doesn't matter to charge that $10. Um, also, when RTD doesn't even uniformly follow the, its own airport fare, the 104L and the 169L do not charge airport fare currently to get to the airport. I would have liked to have seen that. A couple of things on that. We did experiment with, uh, we took the airport fares and started, without getting into too much detail, kind of lowering them and started seeing what the impacts would be. The two things we started to see one of which somewhat important, uh, the revenue impact started to become greater. But the bigger thing that we saw was, and I know only enough about the Title VI analysis to be marginally dangerous, but we started to see that there was a disproportionate benefit to from those reductions to our higher income riders and less so to our lower income riders. And so we started to see what could be uh, raised as Title VI findings with the reduction in those fares. So that was one of the drivers of keeping it where it was because our general manager also expressed some similar concerns to what you just brought up. Where is the guy? Uh, thank you. This was helpful information. I just had a question uh, regarding the youth zero fare pilot. And if you could shed, uh, how are you all defining youth? Would it be similar to the feds uh, inclusive of 24 year olds because that recognizes advanced adolescence? We were looking at 19 and under. Dr. Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris, could you, uh, on your EcoPass slide, you, there's a bullet on there that says no bulk, I'm sorry, no bulk customer on there. Could you clarify what that means? Yeah, it, that's, an, uh, not worded well, sorry. It, basically what it's meaning is uh, it, EcoPasses would not be eligible for any kind of bulk discount uh, along with the bulk discount that we would be introducing. I just take that out of there, sorry. So. Thank you. Thank you. Back to a little bit of what um, or, I don't know. Anyways, um, I actually take the 104L and used to pay the airport fee, and then I don't know when it changed, but it still says on the website, I think, that it is the airport fare. And so when you upgrade or update all of this to whatever it ends up being, I think clarity on the website as well as the app and everywhere, it, it, I'm always nervous about, do I need $10? Do I need the three? Which one do I need? Which one should I buy? And then I use the app. So if you buy the wrong one, then you're just stuck with it. And then it expires. You can't do anything. So it, it would help if it was, I guess, it's going in and out. Yeah. Questions or comments? Dr. Marcano? Marcano. Marcano, you got it. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. You bet. Um, so could you remind us how much of RTD's bottom line comes from fare box recovery? Right now we are down to approximately 10%. 10%? So down considerably from what it was pre-pandemic. Can I ask a follow-up? All right. So how much is RTD spending on fare enforcement? Uh, how much does that cost versus how much do you recover through that activity? I don't know. The we, we've looked in this, the, the questions come up before, I, I, so I don't know the actual numbers. It's, they're not even, but a um, couple of the things that it, it, we have, it, in some rough analysis that we've conducted, if we were to eliminate fares completely, it would hit, it, while our fare recovery ratio is definitely way lower than it was, and so that, as I said earlier, does give us a lot more flexibility than what we've had, you know, it's not going to make a huge incremental difference. We figured anything uh, below 20% of what we are currently getting from the fare box is it, then we're starting to get into the area where we would have to start making some service cuts. So 
that we figured that was sort of the cushion that we had before there would be impacts to the uh, keeping the number of service hours that we have out there now. And that's justified again then by the current enforcement activity around that? I'm sorry, what? Sorry, so the current enforcement for fare box, you know, violations justifies then their existence. They recover more than it costs. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Thank you. I didn't. Cuckroll. <laughs> uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that the current LIVE program requires uh, riders to be able to provide an address within the RTD service area. Is, that, uh, is dropping that requirement going to be part of the expansion of LIVE? Yeah, I didn't, we don't have that on the slides, but that is one of the items uh, that we did hear that quite a bit, that, that for you know, somebody that may be coupled up with a relative or somebody outside the district, and then they were automatically being eliminated. So yeah, we would, we're, we're proposing nixing that as well. Dr. Saltzman. Thank you. I just want to thank Chris Quinn and RTD for doing the extensive outreach on this to come up with the idea of doing the cohorts and the different types of languages and the different types of outreach, I think was really successful model for us to all follow. So I think that is super cool. Thank you, Chris Quinn. And I also um, think that this is a, a massive step in the right direction. And so often we have to provide negative feedback to RTD. So I wonder if the board could provide some positive feedback, like this is massive massive simplification and cost saving for our residents. And so I just wonder if there's some way we could draft some kind of a positive message collectively to send on to the board. This seems like a huge improvement to me. A couple of thumbs up. <laughs> this consensus is, is the, the board as a whole comfortable with us doing some sort of state? How would we? Well, we can definitely do that and, and, and we'll work through, through the chair if that's fine with you all. Uh, yeah, great. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. We don't get that off. Please. I think, thank you, sir, very much. See, my mic is on. I, I, we had this presentation at Regional Transportation Committee yesterday, and uh, I was sitting there and I was kind of smiling and proudly for any of the, anybody in the room that served on the RTD Pass program working group back in the day. I think, Director Baca, did you serve on that? I thought you did. I thought you did. Um, <laughs> It was, it was, you know, this is kind of where we wanted to get, right? We weren't able to get there at that time, but I'm truly appreciative of the work of staff and the RTD board and the comprehensiveness, as the Director Stolzman Stol Stol mentioned. Um, so thank you very much. I do remember the past program working group. I remember my, probably my first conversation with Director Stolzman. She was, she had, she had thoughts about how, what that past program should look like. I am just, just FYI. Shocked. Final chance for questions? Thank you very much for Thank being here. We appreciate it. Uh, moving ahead to item number 13, the 2023 Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan and your report overview. Jacob, Jacob Reaper, you're up again. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening again, everyone. Wanted to give you an update on our mitigation action plan. This relates to our uh, greenhouse gas compliance that we worked on last year that was referenced earlier in tonight's meeting. Works. Um, so those of you that are on the board last year, we spent about nine months together working on this. You'll very well remember this graphic. We call it our layer cake of strategies to comply with what was then the new um, state greenhouse gas planning standard that was passed in late 2021. I'm not going to go through all these again tonight, but just, you know, our realization of having gone through the work together with you is that it took a multitude of strategies uh, for us to be able to comply with the greenhouse gas planning standard through our revised and updated 2050 regional transportation plan that you all adopted uh, last September. Um, of all those strategies, you'll see the one at the bottom is mitigation measures, and this is as provided for in the greenhouse gas planning standard. 
the idea is if you do all of these other things, you do the, you do the technical work, um, you do everything you can, and you still have that little bit of a gap to close to meet the reduction levels in the greenhouse gas rule, um, then you can use a mitigation action plan to help get you the rest of the way there, and that's indeed what we needed to do. Um, so this just shows, uh, I know it's probably late at night for a lot of numbers, so we're not going to go through this in great detail, um, but just want to be transparent and remind you um, kind of what this looked like <clears throat> through the work that we did. We kind of put this into some thematic buckets around the modeling um, and the work that we did around the transportation plan last year. Um, that's kind of the first row. Um, then we had some strategies, additional programmatic investments. That's the second row. Um, and then our mitigation action plan and then you add those all together, the fourth row, the total greenhouse gas reductions. Um, these are in million metric tons. These are regional numbers. So again, the rule says that Dr. Cog is the Metropolitan Planning Organization. We had to comply with regional targets that were set for our MPO area, and we're complying through our regional transportation plan. So these numbers all relate, again, million metric tons for the entire Dr. Cog MPO area. Um, so you can see when we kind of add all these things together in black, and then compare them to the numbers, the targets that are set for us for this region directly in the greenhouse gas rule in red. Um, you can see, yes, that we complied, of course, which is good, um, but that the mitigation action plan helped us get there. Um, turns out we didn't need the mitigation action plan for 2025 analysis year, but starting in 2030, 2040, and 2050, we did need uh, the mitigation action plan to help us, um, help us comply with the targets. So just a little bit of background reminder on the mitigation action plan. Um, as I said, it is needed as that last step to close the remaining reduction gap. It documents the region's approach to using mitigation measures. Again, this is all a regional analysis. I'm going to overuse the word regional, um, but it's important because that's, that's sort of the lens that we're looking at in this work. Um, reports and analyzes measures at the regional level. Yes, thank you. However, um, as it says on the slide, we do anticipate that implementation would be probably in a small fraction of the region in strategic and applicable geographies. What does that mean in plain English? It means that, um, and you'll see when we get to the strategies, we all recognize, and we recognized this last year when we put it together with you, they don't necessarily apply equally everywhere. They are very targeted strategies. For example, transit-oriented development, you did that around transit, right? Um, so the idea is that these are sort of calibrated or they are set to kind of um, probably be most applicable in those areas where they make sense. Um, the way the rule is structured, we have to do annual reporting. I will talk about that in a moment, but that does give us an ample opportunity to implement successfully over time to achieve compliance, which again starts in 2030. So we have the next seven years now to kind of work through this, to course correct, to adjust, to see how it's going, um, make, you know, make some adjustments, change our mitigation action plan over time as we get to 2030. Um, in terms of the measures themselves, um, not to make this complicated late at night, our measures are policy-based and they're not project-based. And what I mean by that is that this is based off of CDOT's Policy Directive 1610, which lists all of the mitigation measures that are available to use um, in this type of exercise. For us at Dr. Cog, given the sophistication of our plan and our modeling tools, we were able to directly incorporate a lot of those mitigation measures either directly in our regional transportation plan or in our technical analysis, in our modeling, or some other way that we could incorporate them sort of on the technical side. So when we got to the point of needing a mitigation action plan, we looked at kind of what was left for us. And what was left for us were these sort of policy-based, qualitative, land use type of measures. And that's what we built our mitigation action plan on. Um, even though they are measured regionally, they are implemented locally. And I want to be clear about that. The requirement is that Dr. Cog is the MPO as part of the greenhouse gas planning standard needs to adopt a mitigation action plan, but the measures as envisioned and as, as constructed in policy directive 1610, these qualitative measures would be led by local governments on a kind of volunteer basis. Um, and that's the very next point. We said this a lot last year, but it bears repeating one more time. Mitigation measures are voluntary for local governments. They are not required to implement at any specific location, at any specific time or place. The requirement is for Dr. Cog as the MPO to have a mitigation action plan. This is a collaboration and partnership exercise with you all as local governments. This is not a regulatory exercise, right? As I said, they can be adjusted over time based on the implementation status. We have time to work through this. However, annual reporting 
on our progress is required. So our first annual report is due April 1st to the Transportation Commission. Um, so we're starting to go through this for the very first time. We will do this each year that we have an active mitigation action plan. So just a reminder of our measures, I'll just click through the animation here. Um, again, as you see, these are the specific measures that form the basis of our mitigation action plan. I'm not gonna go through these individually, but they again relate to land use, kind of policy things that you all as local governments would do. Um, and you can see the, we had to estimate if we're gonna use these as mitigation measures, we had to estimate the reduction levels, these greenhouse gas reduction levels associated with the mitigation measures. These are in actual metric tons the table before was in million metric tons. We just put these in, in, in actual metric tons because the numbers are small to make them easier to understand. I think the point I'd make about the mitigation measures is that we purposely chose mitigation measures that are um, part of the foundation of the work that you all, have, you all have done and we have done together in this region. We've been doing these things collectively together for a very long period of time. These are not new things for us in this region. We wanted to build on that legacy of planning um, to help ensure success of these efforts going forward. So I'm not gonna go through all of this, but wanted to be transparent and show you the requirements of the annual mitigation action plan that's required by the greenhouse gas planning standard. We have to do each of these things for each of the mitigation measures that we include um, in the plan. This is from the rule um, and from policy directive 1610. Um, as I'll say in the next slide, but I'll start talking about it here. You know, look, you adopted this in September of last year, right? So six months later, we're trying to figure out what to say about these things. Obviously, we haven't implemented mitigation measures as a region in the last six months. So the approach we're taking with this first annual report is more about setting up a framework and structure. How will we track these things? How will we report on these things over time? How do you set a baseline? How do you measure this stuff, right? Um, but these are, these, these are the specific categories that we need to speak to or the specific elements we need to speak to in the reporting. Um, so I'll end on this slide, the key issues. Again, I'm not gonna go through all these bullet points. You can read them. Um, but again, the, the key point for us here is that um, this is complicated and I don't wanna undersell how complicated it is. For example, are we gonna track every rezoning that a local government does in this region to see if it's applicable for a mitigation action plan? Are we gonna be that sort of accounting, you know, bean counting zoning, you know, tracking sort of mechanism? Short answer is no, we don't think we're going to do that. We wanna find a more efficient way to kind of get a handle on that. Um, but for each of these measures, we do have to kind of think about how do you set these things up? How do you track them? How do you show progress over time? How do you establish a baseline? How can we work with all of you and support you for those of you that are doing these things, that are interested in these things? Um, that's a commitment we made as Dr. Cog staff. We want to support you. Information, education, resources, data, um, staffing support, whatever we can do to help you if you're interested in doing these things. And we never wanna miss an opportunity to let you know that we care and we're interested when you do these things. Um, and you all have been and will continue to do these things over time around things like redevelopment, rezoning, transit-oriented development, parking policy, complete streets. So we wanna start knowing about that and, and letting you know that we wanna know about that and kind of capture that work so that we can track that as part of the mitigation action plan. So these are the issues that staff is wrestling with as we're putting together kind of this first framework report. I guess I'll end on, on the final point. You know, you've talked a lot tonight, we've talked a lot recently about other efforts in the region, regional housing strategy, um, transportation and land use integration. Um, we're starting to develop our new unified planning work program. So part of what we're trying to do here is not just check a box, as important as that is, to meet the requirements of the rule, but we wanna leverage the good work that you're doing and that we're doing on these other topics so that we can kind of leverage these efforts and use that data use those staffing resources, use those efforts together um, to help meet these requirements as well so that we don't reinvent the wheel. So that's all I have to say tonight. Wanted to give you that preview, be transparent about what we're doing. Um, this is an administrative staff function according to the rule. We will provide this to the Transportation Commission by April 1st, which is the deadline in the rule. When we provide it to the commission, we will also provide it to you um, so that you all have the report when we submit it. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for you? Run fast. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, just an informational item. You will notice in your packet the administrative modifications to the 25 Transportation Improvement Program. That's informational for you. And with that, we will move on to committee reports. And
I request the reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane. Dr. Cog, we will start with Nicholas Williams reporting on the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, my computer's frozen, so it's going to be real brief here uh, <laughs> on here. Uh, Stack met earlier this month. Uh, two action items of note. First was a uh, recommendation for a slate of projects to receive Safe Routes to School funding. Uh, Safe Routes to School funding, this is for infrastructure and non-infrastructure projects uh, for element, or kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, three projects from our region were selected, uh, one from City and County of Boulder, one, I'm sorry, one from the City of Boulder, one from the County of Boulder, and then one from uh, Denver uh, on this. Uh, about $5 million available, but only about $3 million um, uh, uh, allocated through this plot. Uh, robust discussion about uh, wanting to potentially do a second call to make sure, but ultimately I, I think the decision was to recommend that that money be rolled into the next biannual um, call for projects. And second item uh, dealt with uh, pavement condition. Uh, federal rules were for uh, 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 federal federal highway system. Uh, pavement condition must meet a minimum of uh, no more than five, um, less than 5% of pavement in poor condition. Colorado is approaching that at 3.9. Uh, so the, the recommendation was to allocate some additional funding for two projects uh, dealing both with I-25 uh, between six and uh, I-70, as well as uh, I-70 at E-470 uh, on there, and that was recommended. Also heard a information item on the annual budget. Concludes my report. Great. Thanks, Brett. On to the report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Dr. Starker, Mayor Thank Bud you, Starker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My report will be a little bit briefer. The caucus has not met since our last meeting, so I do not have a report tonight. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, report from Metro Area County Commissioners, uh, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, MAC Metro Area County Commissioners met on February 17th here in the Dr. Cog's offices. Um, it was facilitated by Boulder County. Thank you for doing that. And it was a presentation from Heidi Grove. It was about the all in the federal strategic plan to end homelessness. And our next meet, we set up the meeting schedule for the coming year. Next meeting will be April 21st. Thank you, that's my report. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, one of, to me, the most important reports we get from Jayla Sanchez Warren on the Advisory Committee on Aging. Thank you so much. Everybody's saying to me on the way up, brief, Jayla, brief. Um, <laughs> but there's some important things going on. So um, uh, we got an update on the hospital transformation program. This is a program that's designed to improve the quality of hospital care provided to Medicaid members. Um, over a five-year per period, the hospitals will be transferring from a fee-for-service model to a pay-for-performance model. How that impacts the area agency on aging is they're going to ask people, their patients, um, before they leave the hospital, do you need help with housing? Do you need help with transportation? Do you need help with getting food? And guess who they're going to call if they're over 60? They're going to call us, right? And so um, we are watching this very closely because the hospitals um, under this model are going to be reimbursed for making referrals to the Area Agency on Aging and community-based providers, but they're not going to pay for the services. And we keep on saying... Um, uh, referrals don't change health outcomes, services do. So we're really strongly advocating that that um, that uh, payment for the services uh, be included in this model. We also got a update on uh, transportation. Oh, keeping up with the transportation demand is unbelievable. We fund eight different transportation organizations. We also have an in uh, in uh, uh, house, uh, kind of like an individual mobility management um, program. So people call in, they say, I need a ride. And then my staff says, well, tell me where you're going and tell me, and they try and match them with the appropriate ride. So um, in that program, we provided close to 60,000 rides uh, last year in 2022. We contract with Hop, Skip, Drive, Uber, Uber and Carepool. Um, we uh, also uh, give a lot of bus tickets. So we're really excited about those, those uh, rate changes because that means we're going to be able to provide more bus uh, tickets to uh, the people that we serve. So that's very exciting. Um, we had a, a director in Conklin, Conklin and Director Shaw gave a report, the, the Dr. Cog board report. 
to the Advisory Committee on Aging, and then we had reports from the County Councils on Aging, a lot going on in Jefferson County with the Jefferson County Commissioners and um, the County Council on Aging, so that's exciting. Very much. A report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Regional Air Quality Council met on, on uh, February 27th, and uh, there were no action items. We did have three presentations. The first one was about the hardship waiver program associated with the region's vehicle inspection and maintenance program. Um, and then it was the Dr. Cog show. We actually had two presentations from Dr. Cog. The first was uh, Robert Spots on transportation staff provided an update that you all have seen on the congestion report, our annual congestion report. He did a wonderful job as always. And we also had a presentation from uh, our, um, our transportation demand management, way to go uh, manager, um, Nisha Moksha Gundam, um, who provided an update on some of the, some of the, um, some of the work that we're working on here, in particular, the implementation of House Bill 221026, which is uh, tax credits um, that benefits companies who are, who are willing to participate in transportation demand management programs and what our role we expect that to, what our expected role is to be when this begins to get rolled out. So, and she, of course, as she always does, did a wonderful job. So thank you, sir, so very much. That's my report. Thank you, a report from E470, Upper Multi. Abbreviated, um, for public messaging, E470 can publicize what is happening in our own towns and cities. Uh, so you can contact Jessica Carson there and she'll put you in touch. You already have your PIO do that and she'll put you in touch with the appropriate mechanism that can be multiple Twitter accounts or Insta or whatever else might be appropriate. They're also having a fundraiser for the Transportation Safety Foundation, which is directly within our mission on June 12th, 2023, it's going to be a golf tournament at Blackstone. If you want to know more about toll plazas and what's changing, I can talk about that if price is offline. Very much. Report from CEDA, Terry Spockbaz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, today and tomorrow is the Transportation Commission meeting in March and their workshops. They will be taking a look at the budget for FY24, which will go into the long bill, as was described earlier. Um, additional uh, items that were discussed was an overview of CDOT safety programs and a meeting of the audit and small business and diversity committees. Um, additionally, a couple of uh, folks leaving CDOT is um, Don Stanton, the chair of the Transportation Commission, and is, is leaving. This will be his last meeting. Uh, Amber Blake, our Division of uh, Transit and Rail uh, director, is leaving at the end of the month. And finally, on a good news is the Eisenhower Tunnel, at least the Eisenhower Bore, is celebrating its 50th anniversary, so there's been activities for that um, all this month as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And a report from RTD. We're lucky enough to have Chris Quinn yet again. Thank you, Chris, for being here. <laughs> the only thing worse than the mic control here is just the mic vanishing. <laughs> How's that? Uh, just a couple of things. I think most of you are probably aware that we have been working on a, the Northwest Rail uh, Peak Service study. We are hoping uh, we've got some preliminary numbers and cost estimates, so we will be going to the, our, the RTD board on April 11th to present those. Uh, a couple of other things, um, in, very good news. Um, as part of the president's budget, the Colfax BRT was included in that to the amount of, and I'm here, $127 million allocation uh, for that corridor. And then lastly, um, just a real minor thing, but then for any of you who work downtown or take the 16th Street Mall shuttle, the shuttles, given the 16th Street Mall reconstruction, the shuttles now are completely running on the parallel streets, 15th and 17th, uh, with uh, to allow for expedited construction on the mall itself. Thank you very much. Administrative items. Our next uh, workshop meeting is April 5th. Our next board meeting is April 19th. Are there any other matters by members? 
I'd, I'd like to mention one thing. Uh, I'd like Dr. to. Wheelock. I'd like to thank you for uh, thank you for the recognition. I wanted to thank you for bringing up the ice. Got to hang out and eat a piece of the sheet cake. Stopped in Colorado uh, 52 years, 51 and a half years ago on November the 1st, and by the 11th was working on the first bore of the Eisenhower Tunnel while they were still blasting their way through on the. And uh, got pinned to the wall by a piece of gigantic machinery one night. Uh, was working. Uh, it was. It was one. It was the last pre nepa piece of highway that was built in the nation, and it's the hardest piece of interstate in the nation. And uh, I remember one night, same night, I got pinned to the wall by that piece of machinery and came out miraculously unscathed. Uh, I remember swinging a pick as hard as I could, digging muck and mud and boulders from between the giant iron ribs over the part that we'd already completed. And it was in a t-shirt sweating, and it was in January, and then I looked down at my feet and realized there was ice forming on my boots and my jeans, which gave you some kind of an idea about how it was the last old school piece of highway they built in. <laughs> you know, they were just, they were just, they were just, you know, we were, I, I don't want to, I don't want to use the wrong language, I didn't use anything, but, uh. But it was, uh, yeah. So it was really interesting to hear you bring it up. So, and what's cool was you you go through all that, you go through all that, and all I got out of it was that piece of lousy sheet cake. Bring <laughs> <laughs> that history. Yeah, the matters. With that, we are adjourned. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you. All right, if you need if you need parking passes, Melinda's here. And I'll meet you downstairs, hopefully. I know you know that. You're that kind of a guy. Yeah, I know. Well, you're a guy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.